Hey guys, and welcome to the third installment of Fashvovidic Fashion Vocabulary Video Dictionary. Upon subscriber request, I'm doing a whole video on coat vocabulary. Now, when I am drawing coats, the first thing you have to keep in mind is the weight of the fabric. So for the vast majority of coats, you're going to have thicker materials like these woolens here. And so you're not going to draw really super tight to the body. You're not going to draw things as close to the body as you would leggings, swimwear, tight-fitting tees. Nobody goes to a store to go look at coats, finds a coat, picks it up, takes it to the dressing room, takes all their clothes off, and then tries on the coat to see if it fits. Nobody does that, except maybe flashers. And I don't know, I don't know if flashers are all that concerned with the fit of a coat. And if you're into flashing, uh, don't tell me about it because I think that shit's illegal. A little trick that I show my students who have a hard time drawing the bulk of coats accurately is to take your croaky figure, put a little piece of marker paper on top and draw an outfit. This outfit will skim the body. So even if they weren't wearing something this tight, it would still be smashed up against the body once the coat went on it, right? You're just trying to create a little bit of space here for layering. And I'm not really concerned with adding a lot of design details or construction details. It's about having, you know, creating that silhouette to create layers. And so later on, when you're putting your coat on your figure, you can create that appropriate amount of space. So that your coat is sitting on top of your sweaters. Shoulder line is just above that sweater line. So is your shoulder. So it would accommodate your cable knit sweaters and, and so forth. Car coats are designed with the origins of its utility in mind. Car coats come from when cars were first made without windshields, without doors, they weren't completely encased. And so if it was a little bit chilly out, you had to wear outer garment to keep the wind and dust off of any passengers and the driver, obviously. The coat was designed for a driver's comfort. And so it's boxy, it's short, so you're not sitting on a bunch of coat. And it's boxy and loose with a soft shoulder, so nothing restricts the movement and shifting gears and turning your steering wheel. It's single-breasted, so you don't have a bunch of layers of fabric in the front bunching up. People love this coat because of its classic minimal style that is versatile and goes with a lot of different kinds of outfits. Something this minimal, designers love to showcase a really beautiful, luxurious material like a nice leather or gorgeous cashmere. And uh, it's an easy fit. And so it's just a comfortable coat to wear all the time. Chesterfields are almost the exact opposite of car coats in terms of style. Chesterfields are tailored, more formal, fitted, structured. They're longer. They are, you know, kneeling just above the knee, just below the knee, right around there. And everything is really fitted. It's got a real fitted shoulder. It's got a two-piece sleeve. It has side panels. Um, it's got a proper collar and lapel. They can be single or double-breasted. Side note, all these styles can be worn by men or women, just like jeans. They're men's jeans, women's jeans, men's bell bottoms, women's bell bottoms. Although I don't really encourage anyone to be wearing bell bottoms, but that's a whole nother story. Back to Chesterfields. What's the difference between a one-piece sleeve and a two-piece sleeve? So here's your basic two one-piece sleeve pattern. And this gets sewn into this. This is your underarm seam, and so what you end up with 
is a tapered tube, and that's your underarm seam. When you have a two-piece sleeve, you want more shape, better fit, something that really uh, follows the natural contour of a relaxed arm. And so you're going to have the middle part. And then you're going to have your underarm part. And so when you sew everything together, this to this, and then this to this, you're going to end up with a sleeve. It's going to be more fitted, more exact, better tailored. Here are your two sleeves. So this is your underarm piece. This is your top sleeve piece, and that's your two-piece sleeve. You can have a Chesterfield that is double-breasted. Buttonholes go inward. Here's your center front. Buttons must be spaced symmetrically. And again, your nice tailored shoulder. Yoke seam. And on women, instead of the fitted side panel, you would have typically a princess seam to create that fit. Or at the very minimum, a long fisheye dart to create that fit. And again, your two-piece sleeve. When you have a coat that is this fitted, you need some kind of vent to allow for movement. I mean, these are knee length and they're close to the body and you don't want to just only be able to walk in them with it flapping open. And so you're typically going to have some kind of vent and you can have a center back vent, or you can have two. One on, you know, either princess seam. On men, they would sit along the side panel, but in the back. And those are called kick pleats. Sleeves have vents too. Your standard two-piece sleeve, you'll see the buttons here, right? And typically, this is a sign of how well-made the jacket is, how high, good the quality is, how expensive it is. So couture, ready-to-wear, bridge, occasionally contemporary. Those more higher-priced jackets will have a working vent where you do have actual working buttonholes and you can actually open the placket in here. Budget brands, they might put in the buttonholes, but it won't be a working vent because that is a lot of extra sewing. Speaking of working buttons, let's talk about some buttons. So we have your standard four hole button, you know, they get sewed into the coat. Here's a side view and Typically, with a four-hole or two-hole button, you'll have a thread shank. And it's necessary to have this spacing in here because, again, these coat fabrics are really thick. And when they're folded over with facing and sewn in with lining, they're extra thick. And so you need that space in between the button and the surface of your coat so that you could fit another layer of coat in there. If you don't have enough space in there, it yanks on the threads too much. And so that's what leads to buttons falling off early on. You can have a button stay. Some people call it stay buttons. Stay buttons or button stays are a small, unobtrusive, undecorated, typically, button that gets sewn on the underside of the coat. And so the threads from your four hole button get sewn into your button stay. And so when you're yanking on this button to close and open your coat all the time, these threads are yanking on this button instead of your beautiful, luxurious and soft coat fabric. And so the button stay takes the brunt of the force and so does the thread instead of your 
quote fabric. And so when this pops off, you know, your threads finally get undone. It's super easy to, you know, fix this up because this coat fabric won't have been yanked and the holes aggravated, et cetera, et cetera. This kind of construction is especially important in leather jackets and coats where the holes do not heal. The holes in leather are forever. So you need this so that should your button fall off, you know, maybe you can heal it up with some interfacing underneath and then re-sew the whole rigmarole together. Whereas if the thread is constantly pulling on the leather and rips a hole in your leather, that's a much harder fix. You can also have metal shank buttons. The side view looks more like this. It's got its own metal shank and you know there's usually some kind of design here lots of military styles have metal shank buttons because they're more durable and then you have covered buttons which are basically shank buttons with fabric covering whatever plastic or metal is underneath and you most often see covered buttons in evening wear you guys have all seen those wedding dresses where there's a whole row of covered buttons going down the back, right? A real classy way to finish a closure. Those are covered buttons. With outerwear, you have a couple of different buttonhole options. You have a bound buttonhole. It looks like a little double well pocket. The opening is in here. Your, your button will sit like this. Buttons don't sit in the middle because of the way the coat wants to swing open, gravity, forces, your armpits pulling, all that good stuff. Your shank will sit on one side. And so your the center, your button is actually off to one side. Then you have keyhole buttonholes. They look like old school keyholes like that. And the machine will sew threads all the way around in this shape. And you could do this by hand too, but oh my God, why would you? That takes 800 hours. And then in the machine, there's a big knife that comes down and clonk, cuts that fabric in between the thread spacing so that you can push your button through. So the first time I saw one of these puppies in action, I was an intern and I had taken some samples to get these keyhole buttonholes done. And the guy just was like, hey, sit here and wait while I do these real quick. And so I sat there and I was not expecting the giant clunk of the blade. And I was startled and maybe I squealed a tiny bit. Yeah, he totally laughed at me. And I think that was his whole joy in life was listening to young interns jump at the sound of big blades cutting through several layers of wool. And you know, everyone needs a hobby. Basically cocoon coats or any kind of coat where it poofs out and does not fit around the waist or hips or any of that business. They can be double-breasted or single-breasted, can have any kind of collar or sleeve. You can have one that has all these gathers down here. Or you can have one, you know, has an actual collar. It can be fitted at the top if you want it to and just have it billow out. Yeah, so all those kinds of details don't matter. Cocoon coats just refer to a round shape in the overall silhouette. Frock coats are the exact opposite. Frock coats are fitted at the waist, can be single-breasted, double-breasted, have a shawl collar, whatever. But they are fitted at the waist and have a flared bottom. Frock coats are typically longer than knee length, so knee length, below the knee, midi, or T length, which is even longer. 
And people think that this is a really feminine style, but it's not. Its origins come from menswear, actually. Men's coats designed to be worn for formal occasions. Frock coats have the fitted seams. Maybe some cool kind of pocket that's a little bit more subtle. Frock coats are definitely a dressier look and are often done in fancier materials. Let's talk about lapels real quick. So we have three basic styles of lapels. You can have a notch lapel. Okay, where it just comes Here's the roll of your, your collar and lapel, and then it comes straight down, and then there's your break. Lapels are constructed as part of the center front panel. So here's your neck, here's your shoulder, here's your armhole, there's your center front line. And lapels are an extension of that. They come out like this, and then this part, has a facing sewn to the reverse and then folded back. And that's how you can have lapels that are a contrast fabric to the rest of the coat because it's actually the facing that's sewn on the back or inside and then folded over, right? And then you have peak lapels. That look like a little V and your collar is sewn into the joint of the V there. And this is a slightly more formal look. And then you have shawl collars, which, you know, they're not really a lapel. It's a collar, but because of the position on the body, it resembles something that belongs in the lapel family. And so it just kind of goes in there. But here's a shawl collar, and it looks like a lapel without any breaks in them got your button and buttonhole here. And shawl collars are just basically super long collars. And so when you look at the back of a shawl collar, you'll have a center back seam. And that is really necessary to get it to wrap around the neck smoothly because that's a lot of, lot of curve. And so this other side will come across, you know. And this is... Shawl collars, you'll see them most often on classic tuxedos. Usually you'll have like a black satin shawl collar on top of a black wool. Nice little texture change. And if you want to get extra super fancy, we have opera coats. Most people think opera coats are just for women, but uh, whatever, we're in fashion and I am all about gender fluidity in expression. So yeah, if you're a boy and someone says you can't wear opera coats, tell them I said, I bet to differ. Opera coats, opera coats are super fancy and they are typically floor length, ankle length, maxi, whatever. Um, some of them have trains. You know, they're basically, they're not really for warmth, guys. They're for, oh, you know what they're for? They're for when you're getting out of your limo in front of the opera house and you have to walk up the steps from your limo and it's a little nippy out and you need something fabulous to wear for your 100-foot stroll. Opera coats are typically done in really sumptuous, beautiful fabrics like brocade, duchess satin, some more lighter weight leathers, furs, and they're not fitted. They're just like giant wraps. They often don't have closures. They're not fitted. They are just supposed to look beautiful over your evening wear. The key to drawing opera coats is really to get a handle on your line quality and your ability to create long, smooth lines. You don't want to draw an opera coat where you're trying to figure out the shape with little scattered lines as you go. No, you want long, smooth strokes with your pencil. Next on our alphabet list is parkas. Parkas can be short or long, but your standard parka is a lightweight fabric, 
often some sort of polyester or rayon that's been stuffed with down or polyfill. And so they're, they're typically poofy. You know, fiber technology is a beautiful and magical thing, you guys. And so nowadays you can get warmer and warmer parkas without looking like you're wearing a sleeping bag, which, you know, I would have appreciated when I lived in Alaska. And But, you know, what are you going to do? But you're definitely going to lift off the body a little bit more than you would have with your wool meltons and cashmeres. You know, unfitted, of course. This is a more kind of athletic style jacket, and so you don't want any sort of restriction in range of movement. You're going to see a lot of quilting, and, you know, I have a whole video on how to render quilted fabrics. I'll drop that link below. Most parkas are hooded and often with a fur trim. Number one rule of drawing hoods, make sure you are enclosing the entire head. I've seen some hoods that kind of look kind of pointy like this and you're like, where'd the rest of the head go? So you're gonna make sure you're putting the whole head in your hood and we're gonna put in some sort of like fur trim in here. Here's your basic shape for your fur. And I have a whole video dedicated to how to render fur and also included in that how to deal with fur trim. So you can look at that for more advice. You know, you're going to see a little bit of the other hood. Everything about parkas is about how to keep the wearer super warm. And so you have the down or polyfill stuffing. You have a hood with a fur trim. You have sleeves that are enclosed in some sort of fur, like something that's tight. So you'll often see um, like the poofy sleeve with an elastic cuff or a cuff that has a button or an, a rib knit so that it closes around the wrist so no wind can come in. Center front plackets are generally used to cover a zipper or a row of buttons underneath, sometimes both, so that no wind can escape through buttonholes or zipper teeth in the front. And you know what? If you've lived in places like Florida or Texas your whole life, you may not think that's a big deal, but when you live in places like Alaska, every little bit helps. Trust me on that, okay? And then usually on the bottom, the bottoms will a lot of the time be typically relaxed but there will be kind of like a draw cord, bungee cord sort of thing so that if it were to get really cold, you could close up the hem of the parka. And some parkas are really short. They're more like jacket length. And then they'll have the elastic or the rib to cut off cold air coming up from the bottom. Pea coats are navel in origin, so they too have a stylistic references that come from utility, a really thick, high collar. You know, when you're on a boat in the middle of nowhere for a really long time, you want that warmth, protect your neck from the ocean spray. They're double-breasted for extra warmth. They're a little sh on the short side when it comes to coats, but that I'm assuming is for mobility. When you're a sailor, you probably want to be able to move very easily. Kind of a not that structured shoulder. Again, ease of movement. Pea coats typically have really big buttons and buttonholes. And it's a boxy fit. Military issue is not Savile Row. So we have some boxy styles, roomy styles, you know, room to grow, room to move. There's your side seam pockets in here. 
typically welt pockets and they'll typically have some kind of top stitching that really anchors the corners for strength. Let's talk about pockets for a minute. There's a lot of things you can do with pockets in terms of design, um, but there are some basic categories that pockets fall in. So let's talk about some of the most common ones, especially when it comes to coats. So we have welt pockets. You can have a single welt pocket and the opening is at the top. You can have a double welt pocket and the opening is in the middle. And you can make a lot of style variations on these in terms of how wide your welt is going to be or how skinny, how wide across your pocket is, what kind of top stitching you're going to do. You can see like a lot of Western style jackets with, you know, this kind of fancy sort of top stitching. You can do single needle top stitching, double needle top stitching for more casual styles. You can do, you know, this like navel sort of anchor down at the corners kind of top stitching for strength. You can do no top stitching for a more sleek formal look, all those things. You can add a button with a button loop in here. You can add a pocket flap. So the pocket flap will come from the center of a double welt pocket so you only see the top one. And you can make pocket flaps in all kinds of shapes and sizes and styles. Sometimes you, can, you have a button and a little buttonhole here to hold things down. Lots of different things. Then you have patch pockets, just a patch of fabric. And they're top stitched all the way around, single needle, double needle, what have you. But you're going to need some kind of reinforcement in the corners. A lot of the time you'll see this little triangle action happening. Sometimes you'll see a metal rivet in the corner. But these are high abrasion areas that get a lot of wear and tear. And so you want that extra little strength in there for the longevity of your garment. And then you have on seam pockets. So if you have a garment, here's your side view. And here's your side seam. And you want to create a look with pockets, but you don't want the pockets to be part of the design. And I am a big fan of that because I love pockets. I'm always pushing my women's wear students to put more pockets in their clothes. That's right. Zoe Hong has a very quiet operation pockets crusade going on all the time. And if you don't want pockets as part of the look, you can create on scene pockets. And they're basically just like an opening in your seam. Just open big enough for your hand to go in and then your pocket bag is inside here and it just looks smooth and like nothing on the outside if you sew it correctly. Swing coats uh, can be double breasted, single breasted, any kind of collar, any kind of sleeve, any kind of fabric. The swing coat word comes from this sort of trapeze, shape. It's not a cocoon because it doesn't taper back in again. It is an A-line coming off the shoulder. So a tent or a trapeze shape. So it'll be, you know, fitted around the collar and shoulders. Not necessarily tailored, but it'll be fitted in here. And then the shape will swing out. Ha ha, swing coat. It swings out. And you know, I prefer swing coats to be made in a kind of fabric where it will utilize the shape and so it'll literally swing with the body as it walks. I love that. Super fun. Good times. What have you. Toggle coats are oft also known as duffel coats. And I know why they're called toggle coats. I don't know why they're called duffel coats, so I call them toggle coats. Toggle coats are called toggle coats because they are uh, coats with toggles. Huh. I know, I know. My geekiness knows no bounds. It's sad and horrific and hilarious 
occasionally. So toggles are those closures that have the, the loop made of rope on one side, and then you have the wooden toggle that slips through coming from the other side. And so toggle coats are any number of coats that have toggles. You know, standard toggle coat is, you know, kind of a boxy woolen knee length, mid thigh to knee length kind of coat. It typically has a hood. You know, toggle coats are kind of um, typically merge utility and warmth that is a little bit dressier than parkas. So you'll have a fitted shoulder. But it'll be a little bit boxier in shape. It won't be as fitted as a Chesterfield. It won't be quite as long either. So more in here a little bit longer is okay and then you have your toggles however many you want you know, and here's your placket underneath and you'll typically have a zipper in there home stretch two more guys hang in there with me Trench coats are the original raincoats before fiber technology allowed us to create waterproof fabrics. Design details on trench coats were developed uh, thinking about keeping the wearer dry. Trench coats are on the lighter side typically, like I've seen a lot of like leather trench coats, but traditional trench coats were on the lighter side because I'm assuming it rains in the spring and then it snows in the fall. And so it's really about the spring wet high collar to keep your neck dry, double breasted as your fronts will stay drier than a single breasted. Some sort of sash buckle type belt happening to keep the wear even drier, typically around the knee, you know, just above the knee, knee below the knee. You know, raglan sleeves allow for you know, more room for more clothes in here. You'll have a cincture with a buckle around the wrist, again, to keep the wear dry. So you can move your arms around and water won't fall right in. And then pockets will typically be a double well with pocket flaps and buttons to keep all the contents inside your pockets dry as well. And then the back, here's your raglan, and then you'll have a storm flap in the back. Some of them are open like this. Some of them actually have a button and a buttonhole to kind of hold that down. So side view on a storm flap, so storm flaps are this extra piece of fabric that comes down and, you know, this is the rest of the coat. Storm flaps come down like this. And so when it's raining, your water will come down and drip off instead of soaking the rest of you. Also another layer for extra waterproofing, even if the fiber content isn't technically waterproof, it really helps the person say drier and warmer, and that's a storm flap. Wrap coats, what are wrap coats? Think about it. They're coats that you wrap and cinch with a belt. That's all. <laughs> not a trick question. They will typically not have any other kind of closure. The whole thing is supposed to look like a beautiful bathrobe that you can wear out of the house. <laughs> Wrap coats, like wrap dresses, fold, fold, sash, tie, that's it, beautiful. That's it, guys. I love vocabulary lessons. I'm a big fan of 
correct design communication. If you follow me on Instagram, you know that I've recently started a fashion alphabet vocabulary series. So go check that out if you got a minute. I'm having so much fun with it. And uh, as usual, leave me all the questions, comments, and lesson requests in the comments box below. And then that's it, right? Okay. Yeah, that was a lot of stuff. A lot of words. So many words, all the words. I'm a big word geek. You know, when you have a fashion geek, merge with a word geek, you end up with me, someone who makes these videos for funsies. All right. Okay, guys, that's a wrap for today. Have fun, go practice drawing, and I will see you next time.